Happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope everyone's having a great week so far. We are wrapping up SD-WAN this week. We have been exploring SD-WAN for several sessions now. I believe this is the third session. And so we are discussing SD-WAN Advanced Services, kind of the catch-all, really. We, we've spent a lot of time looking at the general architecture of SD-WAN. In this uh, session, we're going to be talking about all of the little special things that make SD-WAN that much more effective at helping us manage and maintain our wide area networks. Um, just uh, let's take a look at the agenda here, I suppose. So we're going to be talking uh, about a lot of things today. We've got zero touch provisioning to look at, um, zero trust model, a lot of zeros for whatever reason, uh, edge redundancy, DPI, on-ramp, that's like cloud services, V analytics. So uh, yeah, a lot to cover as usual. So um, as always, be sure to chime into the chat. This has been pre-recorded. Um, but I am here live in the chat, ready to answer any questions you may have, given that this is an Encore study group. If we are talking about something that you're not quite studying right now, but you've got some questions about some other things that you're working on, then toss those into the chat because whether it's me or somebody else, we can chime in and maybe help get you through whatever issue that you're hitting. So, all right, with, uh, without further ado, oh, wait, my whiteboard is again, not quite ready. There we go. All right. Let's take a look at some of these SD-WAN advanced services. So um, one of the first concepts that we're gonna be talking about here is this zero touch provisioning, which really has two words for it. So the idea is this, we wanna be able to send a router out to a remote site. And if this was traditional networking, I tell you what, I've done so many of these where I've just had to go out to a new site. Let's say maybe we're spinning a new site up or what have you. And, and I got to go out and I got to provision a router or a layer three switch or something, but just to get initial configuration on, I mean, maybe, maybe I could, you know, have it shipped to my desk and, you know, I do the configuration and I give it to a lower level tech and maybe they can run up and just plug it in and hopefully it works. But usually there's some level of me needing to go on site involved with deploying a new location. And so with a wide area network router, wouldn't it be lovely, wouldn't it be lovely if I could ship this router out to that site, have somebody plug it into power and plug it into the network, right? I mean, we, have, we do have to have network connections, but then just have it automatically come online, have it automatically download the configuration. That's exactly what we can do in an SD-WAN environment. We have two different related technologies for this. We have zero touch provisioning or ZTP and we have plug and play or PNP and technically it's plug and play connect. So the difference between these has to do with the fact that zero touch provisioning is a Viptela, in other words, a V edge technology and plug and play connect, this is Cisco's technology. So this would be for C edges. So for those who maybe haven't seen the other videos in the series, Cisco acquired this SD-WAN solution from a company called Viptela. And so when we look at all of the different components, we've got things like vSmart and vEdge and v uh, monitor, not monitor, vManage. <laughs> I can't spell, there we go. Uh, vManage, I don't know, I'm sure that works. And then, um, oh, what am I forgetting? vManage, vSmart, vEdge, vBond. The glue that holds it all together. Uh, all of these Vs here stand for Viptela. And so all of these devices are what Viptela made and this VEdge specifically is a router. Now, Cisco is a company that's been making routers literally since they were created. Um, Cisco being created, not routers necessarily, but <laughs> almost. And so they know how to make a router. And so the one component in the solution that they did not need is the VEdge. And so they are deprecating the VEdge. In fact, I just, so I recorded some, uh, some you know, working for CBT Nuggets, I recorded some nuggets or some videos for um, Encore about what May time frame? It's September now. So, I mean, like three or four months ago, I recorded a video on the V edges and the different models that there are. And I just went to record a very similar video for the SD-WAN content that we're going to be releasing here within a few uh, few weeks here, hopefully. And they like some of the V edges had disappeared. <laughs> like Cisco is like uh, deprecating them. They're, they're getting rid of them. They're end of sailing them. And so they're trying to get rid of all of the Viptela hardware and software that was router related. Okay, all these other components, the vSmart, the vManage, the vBond, they're not going anywhere. We need those um, to make the solution work. So all that to say, we have some customers out there that the edge routers are vEdges 
And we have some customers out there who have V edge, uh, well, I should say a mix, a mix of V edges and C edges. I guess I didn't say it, but C edge would be the Cisco version of the hardware. So if you deploy a Viptela router, which is still branded Cisco at this point, but a piece of Viptela made hardware, that would be a V edge. If you're gonna do it with a Cisco made piece of hardware, that would be a C edge. And so these C edges are usually the, uh, the typical candidates that we buy from Cisco, an integrated services router or an aggregation services router, uh, or maybe even a CSR, a cloud services router, that would be a virtual version of a, um, an ASR. And so really what we have here is we've got two different worlds that Cisco is kind of trying to bring together, okay? So the idea here is this, that we are going to use this concept of either zero touch provisioning or plug and play connect to bring this device online automatically. All right, so here's, here's the process for this, okay? We are going to connect this device into our WAN circuit, whatever that is, and we do need to obtain a DHCP address and with that we need a DNS server mapping. And the reason for that is because in order to go out and do the automatic download, we have to go out to the appropriate website and we're going to go out to the appropriate website, we need name resolution. And so we're gonna go out, we're going to get our DHCP address, get our DNS server, and we're going to resolve a, a very specific URL. And that is, oh, what is it for Cisco? Device helper, that's right. So for Cisco, that would be device helper, device helper.cisco.com. And for Viptela, this is a little easy to remember, it's ztp.viptela.com. Um, those are the two different uh, URLs that we're going to use in order to figure out, hey, where can I go download my configuration? And assuming there's a config out there, it's going to go out to one of those two locations and pull the configuration down. And specifically, the configuration at that point would be, be the vbond address because keep in mind that the V-Bond is, again, as I just mentioned earlier, right? It's the glue that holds this all together. It's the first part of the whole fabric bring up process. So an edge, edge router will go out uh, to the V-Bond. The V-Bond will tell it where all the other controllers are. The, the V-Manage will push its config down to the, to the V-Edge and the V-Smarts, so it'll form routing relationships with the V-Smarts and so. Um, all we really need is the V-Bond address. I mean, that's the, the biggest piece of configuration that we need. All right, so how exactly does this get out into, well, get into Cisco servers, essentially is what's gonna have to happen, right? Um, specifically, we have a concept, or not a concept necessarily, I guess, but this plug and play connect concept, we have a portal. If you go to software.cisco.com, you will find that there is a plug and play connect portal. We can use that portal to input information on that router. So there is still work to be done. And it says zero touch provisioning. I actually like plug and play connect better because the idea of zero touch provisioning kind of makes it seem like it's just gonna go out and download a generic config or something. It's gonna automatically do stuff. And I never need, literally it says zero touch, right? I mean, I shouldn't have to touch this at all. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to touch it. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to do some amount of configuration and most of that's going to be done via that plug and play connect portal. So I will go out there, I will register the device, provide its serial number, its chassis ID. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that you really have to, oh, well, and the other thing you have to do, didn't think about that, is, uh, well, it's actually, it's right here, vManage. I have to get in here and I have to create the configuration for that router. Because again, that router is going to get the VBond address and then it's going to pull, I'm sorry, it's gonna pull the VBond address from Cisco. Then it's gonna go out to the VBond, which I guess is over here now. It's gonna go out to the VBond and then the vManage will push the configuration down. Well, that configuration has to be configured, <laughs> has to be there. And so I'm going to put the configuration onto vManage first. So this is my two main steps I have to do. I have to get into vManage. I have to make sure there's a configuration in place and in SD-WAN world, we do that via templates. So I need to make sure that we have a config in place on vManage. We also have to make sure that we've configured the plug and play connect portal for this device. Um, one thing worth noting, by the way, is that um, even if we're doing Viptela stuff like vEdge, we're still going to go into the plug and play connect portal. Cisco on the back end will push 
information down to the zero touch provisioning server, that would be Viptel's original uh, server set. And so even though we're going to a different server with Viptela hardware, we still download the same information. Whew, okay. So um, that is one uh, automatic provisioning option. We do have one other uh, option, I suppose, that's worth pointing out. We have what's called the bootstrap option. And the bootstrap option is C-Edge only, does not work with Viptela. And the idea is that we will actually um, provide a configuration on the device so that it has a chance of, trying to think of how to say this. What, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go out to this plug and play connect, uh, wait, wait, no, no, vManage portal, right? Yes, wait, <laughs> getting all mixed up here now. Um, the bootstrap option, yes, it is, okay. So we go to vManage and we create a config file on v, at vManage. vManage gives us the option to create this configuration file. This configuration file needs to be named very specifically, uh, whoops, Cisco SD WAN dot CFG. And by the way, if you're gonna do anything with an ASR 1002X, make sure you do the proper reading. It's actually different. It's like Cisco SD WAN underscore cloud underscore init, I think, something like that. Um, let me see real quick, I've got it written down somewhere. Yeah, it is. It's uh, a Cisco SD WAN underscore cloud underscore init dot config. Uh, the 1002 X does not support plug and play for whatever reason as a C edge. So you kind of have to do bootstrapping if you're going to do it and it requires a different uh, config file name. So 1002 X is just a little bit of an odd beast. Just be warned about that if you're ever going to be doing any of this with a 1002 X. Um, but we take this configuration file and we can either load it into the boot flash of that router or we can place it onto a USB stick and, and plug that USB stick in. Of course, that assumes it's a physical router at that point. And so either way, what we're doing is we're essentially pre-provisioning that VBond information and some basic configuration as well. And, and so when the router boots up, it'll check for a config file. It'll check its USB to see if there is a config named Cisco SD-WAN.CFG. And if there is, it'll boot it up if not, at that point, it'll initiate the, um, well, I guess it's a C edge, so it only initiate the plug and play connect option. But the idea is that's our progression, right? We start with bootstrapping, we check for a file. If there's no file, then we go to ZTP and plug and play connect. And if, uh, if nothing works there, if the plug and play connect option doesn't work, then it'll fall back on our uh, you know manual configuration. And we can't always do still a manual configuration. So my initial, uh, scenario where I have to ship a router to my desk and configure it. I mean, that's always an option. We can always do it that way. Incidentally, by the way, bootstrapping is a good option if for whatever reason our WAN service provider, remember we said we needed DHCP services. Uh, not all WAN service providers can provide DHCP services. So that can be a, a big killer of the bootstrap, uh, I'm sorry, of the plug and play connect process. But um, if we want to emulate the plug and play connect process, then that was where we would rely on bootstrapping. With Viptela, we don't have bootstrapping and we just have to go straight to uh, straight to manual configuration. Whew. Okay. Any thoughts or questions on that? Be sure to chime into the chat. I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, what we got here? Yep. Yeah, okay. We're doing all right. So let's talk about what happens at the point where our router now has through some means, plug and play connect or manual configuration, what have you, we know where the VBond uh, IP address is. We've received the VBond IP. So what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to the VBond. Now the VBond has a very specific set of responsibilities, one of which is to authenticate this device. Now, if uh, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm not a security guy. I don't deal with a ton of certificate issues a lot of us in IT have come from various backgrounds and such, but if you've been in networking for a long time and you don't specifically play with security, you probably aren't super comfortable with certificates and such, but um, this is a very certificate heavy process that we're about to describe. All right, the reality is that we have a certificate that comes pre-installed on the C edge or the V edge. And we have a, a certificate that comes pre-installed with the V bond. And we're going to use these certificates to mutually authenticate each other at the very beginning. So at, think about this from this router's perspective right here. 
we just spun ourselves up. We, again, we, we extracted that VBond IP address somehow. This is all I know. I don't know where my VBandage is. I don't know where my VSmarts are. I don't know where other V edges and C edges are. I am blind to the rest of the network. I haven't even actually been allowed to get onto the network yet. Um, I need to authenticate with this VBond controller. So the first thing we're going to do is do the cert exchanges. Right? We're going to make sure that we are who we say we are. And again, what's key about this is that it's a mutual authentication process. So the VBond, yes, is authenticating the edge device, whether it's a C edge or a V edge. And that's important because we don't want rogue devices showing up. I don't necessarily want to risk having a junior engineer pull a router out of my closet and plug it in. And oops, I just added it to the SD-WAN <laughs> fabric. Um, that would be the innocent version of a rogue router. We I mean, by all rights, could have somebody trying to maliciously add their router in. Why not make it a, you know, one, one of my branches? You know, if, if I'm an organization, I've got thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of branches. Um, it would be, it seems like it would be a pretty easy, you know, concept to be able to toss a router in there and try to join their network. <laughs> Obviously it wouldn't be that easy, but at the same time, it's just one more, one more step of security is a good thing. So we want to make sure that the edge is good, but the edge needs to make sure that the V bond is the appropriate V bond, that the V bond is not a, again, a malicious rogue V bond, that it's not accidentally, oops, we configured the wrong V bond controller. So we are um, going to mutually authenticate each other. The edge device will authenticate the VBond controller using its certificate. Now, the way the certificate gets onto the edge device and the way that we do all of this, uh, that's a very complicated multi-step process. Um, in a lot of cases, if it's especially if it's a physical device, it's gonna be fairly straightforward. If you have an, uh, like an organizational uh, enterprise certificate that you're gonna to wanna to put on the edge device, you don't want to use the baked in certificate, then that's a whole process because we have to update the V-Bond with that information. And and so it gets, I mean, frankly, if you're going to set up an SD-WAN lab, this is the hardest part of setting up an SD-WAN lab. It's just getting these devices to talk to each other. I wish you could just disable this for the sake of the lab environment, just being able to say, okay, I'm just going to skip all this and get my V-Bond talking to my V-Edge and my V-Edge talking to my V-Manage. But, um, for better or worse, again, it's more secure this way, for better, <laughs> probably. Um, Cisco, Viptela, they do not allow us to simply connect these devices. We've got to get the certificates loaded. So that means going to Linux CLI potentially and cranking out root certificates and such. All right. So um, that's step one in the authentication process. Here's step two. <laughs> Step two of the authentication process is me as the network admin going to that plug and play connect site and adding this router into the process. Now, if I'm using plug and play connect, then I'll have already added it in there, but just be aware this is still how we have to do this. This gives me a file, the ability to download a file that I can upload into the VBond. And this VBond is going to use that file as a whitelist. Now, incidentally, well, I, whoops, hold up. I skipped a step. This is important. This file actually gets uploaded into vManage. Now, the way this file gets uploaded into vManage is there's one of two choices. I can manually take that file and put it onto vManage, and that's in most cases what we're going to do. But you can actually directly connect our smart licensing portal, which is tied to Plug and Play Connect. I can, pl I can tie vManage to my smart licensing portal. And then therefore, every time I add a router into my list, vManage will be updated. All right, so once vManage has a list of routers, it will push that whitelist to vBond. vBond, again, is going to use that whitelist to determine whether this edge is allowed or not. So not only are we checking the authentication of the, of the certificates, but then the second step is to check against that whitelist. So again, it's quite an endeavor to spin up a lab environment from scratch and start getting this going. Obviously, once the once the fabric is up and running and everything is good, you know, adding routers to it is, is a fairly straightforward process. And it's something that we all get used to at some point. But uh, again, just when you're used to just firing up routers and switches in a lab and connecting them together, uh, this can be a huge barrier to really even just getting started um, having some fun with SD-WAN in the lab. 
All right, so if this all goes well and certificates are good and the, the whitelist passes, uh, at that point, vBond is going to push down the information about where the vManage is, um, where the vSmarts are. There might be multiple vSmarts. And then um, also the, the, the vEdge information, which actually is going to come from the vSmarts, I believe. So either way, um, we're, we're going to get our controller information from vBond and we're going to reach out now. So now I've got a connection to vManage. Now I've got a connection to all of my vSmarts. So my, there are, in a lot of cases, there are going to be multiple vSmarts. All right, and these connections, by the way, worth noting if you're going to go take an exam, vBond has to be a DTTL, the DT, DT, DTLS connection. It has to be a datagram uh, transport layer security. So the DTTLS, DTLS connection is UDP based, whereas a TLS connection is TCP based. So we can use TLS for a vManage and vSmart, and we can use DTLS. Now, we truly get to choose when we build those connections. We, we get to define whether those are going to be TLS or DTLS. And DTLS is just lighter weight, and you know you can choose for yourself whether you want to go with DTLS or TLS connections, I suppose. Uh, but with the vBond, for whatever reason, we don't support TLS. It's DTLS only. So it's just kind of one of those oddities that we need to understand. But... The key point in all of this is that these connections between the edge device and the controllers, these are all super secure, locked down. These are in encrypted tunnels. Just like our edge to edge communications are gonna be in IPsec, uh, the edge to controller information is going to be within a secure encapsulated tunnel and that would be the DTLS or TLS connections. All right, um, so at that point, <clears throat> we're going to then reach out and start to form relationships with other edge devices. So what does that look like? All right, so um, this is get, we're gonna start getting into the edge redundancy conversation here in a moment. But for now, when you've got a router and you have multiple WAN clouds, so maybe WAN one, maybe WAN two, and maybe WAN three. All right, and I'm trying to connect to this router up here. Let's say we've got connections to all three of these WAN circuits. So here's an interesting question. How many tunnels are formed between these two routers? Generally speaking, when we're talking about this, we're going to say that there are three tunnels. We form a tunnel between every set of routers that we want connections between, and we're going to make as many IPsec tunnels as there are WAN service providers. That's technically true, but also tech, <clears throat> but also with a caveat. Um, technically speaking, this router is going to try to form a relationship with every other T-lock on that router from every T-lock on the local router. Now, a T-lock is an interesting concept. It's sort of, it's sort of an endpoint. It's sort of an endpoint and it's uh, tied to a specific circuit. So basically a, sp a specific service provider, but it's also not an IP address, okay? Um, so this, this gives people some amount of confusion, but the idea is this. I've got a T-lock on every one. Let me just do it like this. I've got a, how can I do this? Let me get rid of those tunnels for a moment. Oh, did I have to, there we go, that's what I wanted. Uh, haha. All right, there we go. So I got a T lock. I have a T lock for every WAN circuit um, coming into the, my router. That's the idea. Okay, here's the problem a T lock itself consists of the system IP address, not the interface IP, but the system IP address. It consists of a concept we call color. Color is essentially a string that describes the WAN circuit. So we have a drop down menu when we're connecting uh, up to a WAN circuit, we get to decide what color it is. So it can literally be a color. There are some colors like red, green, blue, blue. Then we have like gold, silver, bronze and such. Um, that would be if we're like comparing our WAN circuits, like they're all internet circuits and then one's just, you know, we got good, better, best. Um, but color can also be a description. It could be MPLS, it could be biz internet, for example, or public internet. And so we've got this color concept that describes or, or that 
I shouldn't say it describes it. I mean, it, it does describe it, but the purpose is, is that each one of these WAN circuits is going to get a different color, which again, amounts to a string. Um, and then the last uh, facet of a T-lock is encapsulation type. Encapsulation type, we always describe them as IPsec tunnels. Um, newsflash, we can't actually configure them as GRE tunnels, but we lose the encryption of IPsec, and so in most cases, we're never gonna use GRE. So um, every one of these T-locks is going to consist of this tuple of information, the system IP, the color, and the encapsulation type. So the only difference between these three T-locks that I have colored in here is the color. Um, we don't actually have different IP addresses among the different T-locks. So this isn't a scenario like, uh, for those who have done, for example, um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here, uh, R-locks, so R-locks in Lisp. Uh, if you've studied software-defined access or you've studied Lisp from a service provider perspective, you have this concept of routing locators. The routing locator essentially equates to a loopback IP address on a switch. And so I know that an IP address is attached to a specific R lock, and then I can just route towards that R lock because it's an IP address. Uh, VXLAN is going to have something similar because we have these VXLAN tunneling endpoints, the VTEPs. I know that my device I'm trying to get to is behind this VXLAN tunneling endpoint, and so I can just target its IP address and go to it. A TLOC does not include the IP address. Um, this isn't tied to a loopback on the router. It's not tied, it is, they are tied to a physical uh, interface, but they're not, well, like they're not, they're, they don't include that IP address as part of the TLOC, okay? Instead, what we have is we are also advertising not only our TLOCs, but then we advertise a TLOC route to the vSmart. So the vSmart's up here. It's listening to OMP advertisements. That's the routing protocol we're running, overlay management protocol. And I send my OMP routes to the vSmarts, including not only the routes behind, you know, like, like subnet A, right? That would be my client subnet. I let it know about that. That's an OMP route. But I also give it a TLOC route. And the TLOC route tells me, or tells not tells me, tells the rest of the world, in other words, the vSmart's gonna pass it along to the other router, hey, when you're trying to get to this T-lock, go to this physical IP address, okay? That was a little bit of a tangent. It's not super important, other than to understand that T-locks themselves are not routable interfaces. They are, are, tunneling, they are tunneling endpoints. We are going to build tunnels between them, but we're going to use the T-lock route to tell us how to get to the other T-locks. All right, let me tell you why I explained all that. All right, because this other router is also going to have three T-locks. The reason I explained all that is because we are not just going to form, by default, we're not simply going to form three IPsec tunnels one-to-one -one with, you know, doing the one-to-one -one relationship with my T-locks. Every T-lock is going to try to make an IPsec tunnel to every other T-lock on the remote router. What that means is this T-lock on the left is actually going to try to form a relationship with the middle T-lock and with the rightmost T-lock. And same thing here. I'm gonna to try to form relationships with these guys. I'm gonna to try to form relationships with those. So we actually have a full mesh, potentially, of IPsec uh, tunnels among all of our different T-locks. So when we have, um, boy, I don't even know. Is that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tunnels, yeah. We have three different devices going to three, I'm sorry, three different T-locks going to eat, each one's going to three different T-locks on the other side. Um, we're going to have nine, nine different IPsec tunnels. So that's the default behavior. However, there's a reason why we usually draw our networks like this to say that there's only three IPsec tunnels. And the reason for that is because there's an air gap between most of these WAN service providers. In order for this T-lock right here to, oh, there goes my camera. In order for this T-lock right here on the bottom left to get to the middle T-lock up at the top, I somehow have to bridge this air gap. Now, if there's truly an air gap there between maybe an MPLS and an internet service provider, then I don't need to worry about cross-color T-locks, uh, cross-color IPsec tunnels forming. Where I do need to worry about this is when WAN 2 is an internet service provider and WAN 3 is also an internet service provider. 
chances are there's not an air gap because it's just one giant global routing table in the internet, right? I mean, it's truly just two different uh, two different circuits that connect me to the global internet. And so if that's the case, really there is no air gap here. WAN two and WAN three are basically the same. I'm just using again, different circuits. And therefore I will be able to form a full mesh of IPsec tunnels among the T-locks that are connected to my internet circuits, okay? Um, so anytime my WAN circuits, or my WAN service providers are sharing a network with one another, I'm going to end up with way more tunnels than I was maybe expecting. So may, write that down in the back of your head. This is behavior we can change. We can make it so we lock it down to colors. And so in that case, even though it's the global internet, I'd still only have three tunnels. In most cases, we're probably going to do this, but you know, technically speaking, it does give us better resiliency to allow it to form tunnels across different WAN surf, uh, service providers. You know, for example, if if this circuit goes down up at the top, this middle internet circuit, I mean, why should I shut down this IPsec tunnel instead? I'm sorry, well, why should I shut down this T-lock effectively? Because if I have a connection this way, then this T-lock can stay online even though it lost one of its IPsec tunnels. And so the, the, the more we can control, or the more, trying to say here, the, the more options we give our SD-WAN environment, the better off we're going to be from an application routing perspective, which we're going to be talking about here in a moment. Um, because otherwise, I mean, if it just goes down and this T-lock doesn't have anything, then I only have two choices. But if the T-lock stays up, even though it's sort of going about things oddly, I still have all three of my choices when I bring a packet in and needing to forward it out. All right, so about halfway done. And we're done with, oh, we're not even done with this section. Ah, all right, very good. So that's general T-lock and IPsec establishment. All right, let's, uh, let's move on <laughs> to what we really needed to talk about, which is T-lock extensions. So this is a great scenario, but however, uh, let's say that this is headquarters and I am not comfortable with having all three of my you know, I've got this crazy amount of resiliency. I've got three separate WAN circuits all coming into one router. I mean, I'm no expert, but I think a second router here makes a lot of sense. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and erase some of these. I can't erase these circuits. Um, let me do this. I'm just going to simplify this drawing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So then get rid of the drawing. There we go. All right, let's simplify this. So I've got two different routers at one site. And let's say I have two different WAN circuits. WAN one, WAN two, and then I've got some kind of downstream network. All right. So if I, um, I have this scenario, again, let's just say this is headquarters. Uh, first and foremost, I can run VRRP between these two routers as a first upper entity protocol. If my users are using <clears throat> the routers as a default gateway, then I would want to do this. So I've got resiliency as far as my default gateway is concerned. Um, if I don't have my users down there, maybe I have like a layer three switch and my users are hanging off of the layer three switch. Then maybe I'll just run a native routing protocol with that layer three switch like OSPF or EIGRP. If it's a C edge, I can do that um, or even BGP, but I might even run VRRP in that situation. It just sort of depends on how I want to set up my routing domain. Okay. It matters a little bit less in an SD-WAN environment because both of these routers are supposed to have IPsec tunnels to both of these WAN circuit providers. And therein lies the question of how I'm supposed to configure this area right here. Because I've got two different WAN circuits. How should I connect these to these two different routers? Well, Cisco gives us a couple of options. The first of which is called meshed. Let me just draw that as a different color. If we have a meshed connection, then as you can imagine, we're going to have some meshed connections here. Uh, we would be able to bring, well, if, if we're going to do it this way, we would bring two separate WAN circuits in. Uh, I should have pointed down here. <laughs> we'll bring a circuit, each circuit into one router. Basically, we're bringing WANs 1 and 2 into router 1, and we're bringing WANs 1 and 2 into router 2. This allows us to build our IPsec tunnels in a straightforward manner. I've got IPsec tunnel one, IPsec tunnel two, 
out of router one, and then router two is going to do the same thing. I've got IPsec tunnel here and IPsec tunnel here. Those those IPsec tunnels would be built to every single other router, by the way. So uh, just keep that in mind as well as we think through SD WAN. So if I've got a router over here, they'd build four tunnels to that router. If we had a tunnel or a router over here, they would build four total tunnels to that router as well. Assuming there's an air gap in here, of course. <laughs> oh, the caveats, they are amounting. Okay, so that that's great. Um, that's what you should do. That's what we should all do if we can. But what if we cannot? What if we only get one circuit connection? Maybe the service provider is giving a slash 30 address, uh, a network. If they're giving a slash 30 network, I've only got one IP address that I can use. And so I can't actually... Like even if I bring it into a little switch, I can't split it up between uh, between the two routers. So I've got ones that may, maybe it's not slash 30, but maybe they only support one physical handoff. Um, or you know, even at that point, you could probably still put a switch in. But the idea is this, if we cannot get a fully meshed set of connections, if we can only do this, where we're bringing WAN one into router one and WAN two into router two, well, we still wanna create those IPsec tunnels. We still need to create those IPsec tunnels. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to leverage a concept that we call a T-lock extension. The T-lock extension is going to allow me to create a local T-lock that allows me then to create my IPsec tunnels. So if I look at it this way, I can still create an IPsec tunnel, you know, the, the, the straightforward ones, right? But now my router on the left can form a IPsec tunnel this way by building a T-lock here. So I didn't really draw my T-locks as dots. There we go. And then I can also create a T-lock here that allows me to create an IPsec tunnel out, whoops, out this way, all right? So effectively what we have in the end, if I were to draw this again, effectively what I have is this. How's that look? Does that look familiar? Even though the physical network has changed, I no longer have a full mesh of connections, my logical network didn't change at all. My overlay stayed the same. Remember this whole concept of, you know, SD WAN, software defined WAN? Remember, a key component of that is the idea that we have an overlay and the overlay consists of tunnels. In our case, IPsec tunnels. In some scenarios, it might be VXLAN tunnels, et cetera. I mean, we've got all kinds of different uh, situations. There. But either way, we have tunnels that form an overlay, and then we have an underlay. And the underlay is the actual physical world. But the idea that we said from the beginning when we defined software-defined networking was to say that the overlay is really the network that I want, and it shouldn't matter what my underlay is. The underlay is actually what I have. But I'm going to build an overlay so that I can have the network that I want regardless of the network that I have. Does that make sense? <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Remember, I, I showed you a mesh connection, and now we've got this uh, this T-lock extension. All right, two different options that result in the exact same thing. Now, obviously, we do still have to configure the T-lock extension, so it, it, it does take some amount of intentionality around our configuration and such. But the end goal is the same. We want to have an IPsec tunnel from every one of my routers out to every other router in the fabric um, per WAN circuit. And we still accomplish that. Incidentally, by the way, I didn't mention this, but we do actually configure these routers with the same site ID. And that allows them to know not to form IPsec tunnels to each other. Because technically they could do that, right? They could form an IPsec tunnel to each other. Um, well, technically it would be like through WAN 1 or what have you. Um, that we, we don't want that. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so the side ID is what helps us identify that. Whew. Okay. Any questions on T-lock extensions or T-locks in general? Uh, chime into the chat. We'll get you taken care of. We are covering a lot today. I say that, I feel like I say that every week, but... <laughs> It never feels like we've got enough time to talk about everything that we need to talk about. But I guess that's the idea of a one hour study group session. Um, let's see here. Next is deep packing session. Okay. So now that we have, see how this keeps building on itself. So now that we have, in fact, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this simple. Let's say we have one router and we have two circuits 
and we're building our IPsec tunnels. Actually, here, I've got my uh, subnet A here with my users. Users, we'll call it subnet A. I don't know that we really needed to designate it as subnet A for what we're doing. But the idea here is I'm going to another router somewhere, and I'm going to form an IPsec tunnel out to it, out WAN provider A, and I'm going to perform or create an IPsec tunnel out uh, the second WAN provider. So that would be uh, WAN provider B. So we've got an A connection, we've got a B connection. <clears throat> so here's, here's an interesting thought. When, in traditional networking, if I want to load balance across those links, how can I load balance that? And, and boy, does that open a world of conversation because, I mean, I could very simply deploy routing-based load balancing and I could have a routing protocol running and especially since I'm running tunnels, you know, I mean, if, if it was traditional, maybe like a DMVPN situation, I just run EIGRP <clears throat> and EIGRP would... Um, it, it would tell me which one's better. And if one is not better than the other, then I could do equal cost load balancing. I could even use unequal cost load balancing with the IGRP, right? But none of those actually are testing the quality of the link. Now with Cisco, I could set up IPSLA and I could run tests across that. And, and this is essentially, by the way, what IWAN was. Um, for those who don't know, before Cisco bought Viptela, they had this solution called Intelligent WAN, IWAN. Uh, Everybody was coming out with these SD-WAN solutions and Cisco's like, we, we, we've had these solutions for, for years. It's <clears throat> uh, performance-based routing and IPSLA and EIGRP and, and BGP configuration and, and all of this. And so Cisco tried to effectively do what Cisco sometimes does and, and not be able to see that the ease of use was a big part of SD-WAN. So IWIN was not an easy to use solution. In fact, I heard countless stories of IWAN deployments turning into Viptela deployments or turning into a competitor <laughs> uh, deployment because IWAN was simply very, very not user friendly. And, but, but technically speaking, we were able to do a whole lot of this with Cisco, traditional Cisco routing. It just wasn't all managed very well. So where is I going with that? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, <clears throat> application routing. So again, we, we've got this concept of like Cisco IPSLA that we could run. We've got all kinds of things, but the reality is from a traditional, even IWAN aside, traditional routing, if I were to say that, hey, I want my voice over IP traffic to take the MPLS link, unless the MPLS link is having some major issues, then I would like you to swing the VoIP traffic out to use the internet link and the internet link, by the way, is going to need the QoS setup on it so that I can handle the voice over IP traffic. But then once the MPLS circuit starts behaving again, I want to swing it back. That's complicated. That's very, very difficult. Um, because again, I've got to have the QoS established uh, on both sides. I've got to be able to recognize when MPLS is online. I've got to be able to swing it over. Um, it's, it's very, very complicated. And then if I told you, again, I'm thinking like I'm the IT director or something here. Like I want you to do this with every application. I want some of my applications to always use the internet link, but if the internet link goes down, I would like those applications to swing over to use MPLS. Some of the applications are not mission critical. I would never want them on the MPLS because the internet circuit is 100 meg and the MPLS circuit is only 20 meg or what have you, right? I mean, like these are the, these are the conversations, the business level conversations that we've never been able to have because we didn't have SD-WAN. It's not that we couldn't do it. It's just that it was so hard and so complicated. And even if we got it working on day one, right? Like, let's say we just got some consultants in and we just rocked out for three months and we got this, you know, I, I don't know how many tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars we spend on engineering services and, um, and just time spent and everything. We get it all working. And then guess what? Like a month later, we get a new application. And a month after that, we get a new WAN circuit somewhere. And, and all of these changes start happening and man managing and maintaining that policy over time is a nightmare. And so sometimes that's the hardest part about having a complicated um, solution like that. Is not, it's not necessarily the initial deployment, but the idea that we could possibly manage and maintain it over time is just, it's just unrealistic. So all of that to say, fortunately, as you can imagine, SD-WAN makes this a whole lot easier. SD-WAN has this concept of application routing. Application routing is going to allow us to do exactly what I was just describing. 
we want to be able to route on a per application basis across different links depending on the day, basically. You know, is it is it is the MPLS circuit having a good day or a bad day? Is the internet circuit having a good day or a bad day? And so if I have if I if I'm having a good day, I suppose, then I want this application, let's say it's voice over IP again. I want voice over IP to hit that router and get redirected out the appropriate link following this methodology of swinging it back and forth on an as needed basis. Um, so we talked last week about the different types of application routing, how you can do like active stand or you, know, you can do active active where you're just load balancing across both links. Um, you can do um, IPSLA based, you can do application aware routing and such. And so there's different options that we can do there. But here's the question, how does this router know that this is voice over IP traffic. Um, classification of network traffic would have been one of the harder parts of deploying what we just talked about before in traditional networking. Like how are we identifying voice over IP packets versus database packets versus email packets? That That's going to be one of the challenges that we'd have to address. Well, now, uh, SD-WAN, we have two different ways of identifying applications. Um, for identification, we have the, really the fallback method, I'll say is the six tuple concept. Um, we have the source and destination IP address. We have the source and destination ports, I'll put IPs and ports. Then we have the DSCP tag from a QoS perspective. And then we have the protocol number. Now that's great. We, we can identify applications that way, but it's not super accurate. I, I mean, at least it's not, it's going to take a lot of work to make sure that we're properly identifying our traffic. Meanwhile, we also have another option. So six tuple is option number one. The preferred option number two is deep packet inspection or DPI. These routers come with a database full of information on how to identify specific applications. And that list of applications is constantly growing, as you can imagine. When you update your version of SD-WAN software, new DPI inspection parameters or what have you get forwarded down to the router and that database gets more full and it's able to identify even more applications. Biggest problem with DPI is it requires dun, 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 a license. So we need to make sure we're fully licensed to uh, to be able to leverage deep packet inspection. It's not something that unfortunately uh, comes with the native SD-WAN uh, product. So, uh, but that said, if you're a large enough organization that you have enough routers that it makes sense to deploy application aware routing, then you're probably going to license your routers for DPI at that point. I mean, it, that it's not just that you're licensing DPI, you're also licensing several other things at once, including like additional topologies with your IPsec tunnels and such. And so once you get up to that level, it's just gonna be one of these things that you're, you're going to have in all likelihood. But the idea is this. So now I've got DPI or even the six tuple. And so I can identify the traffic as it comes in. And then I can send it out whichever link is most appropriate. Now here's the crazy thing. And this is something that, it's more just something to plant in your back of your head. All right, I'm not gonna say that everybody out there is replacing their MPLS circuits with internet links, but at the same time, some organizations are finding success with this. If you think about it, MPLS costs a lot of money, a lot of money. We're talking thousands of dollars a month in some remote locations. And in, in most places these days, you're probably in more like the hundreds a month. But you think about an internet circuit, I mean, internet circuit is cheap. And yet, look at this. This is not at all unrealistic to say, I mean, it's probably unrealistic that the internet would be that small these days. <laughs> I mean, you can get hundreds of megs of internet circuit, raw internet circuit for a fraction of the price of an MPLS circuit that's a fraction of the bandwidth. So it's kind of this weird thing where you pay less and you get more. The reason we go with MPLS though is because there's a third factor and that would be reliability. And MPLS is super reliable compared to the internet, which is just best effort. And so my voice over IP traffic is so important that I would never send it out in an internet link. I would only ever send it out MPLS. But here's what's interesting. What if instead of getting that MPLS link, I were to get two or maybe even three internet circuits? And what if they were truly different internet service providers going through different paths to get to the public internet? If one of my internet circuits is having a bad day, I could swing it over all of my traffic, my voice over IP traffic at least, I could swing that over to a different internet circuit. And so there are a lot of companies that, like 
for for the most mission critical applications, you're probably still going to want MPLS. Uh, if you're a hospital, if you're you know a doctor's office, you know there there are you know law enforcement and such. There are going to be situations where you need the reliability of MPLS. But in a lot of cases, some you you could actually explore the possibility of leveraging two internet circuits. Um, there's a lot of opinions out there about that. Some people are like, no way, never do it. Uh, but there are, again, I mean, you can't deny there are some use cases out there where organizations are actually saving so much money by replacing MPLS circuits that they are able to pay for their SD-WAN, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of SD-WAN technology that they're investing in gets paid off in a matter of months because of the amount of money they save from MPLS circuit payments, which is, which is insane. Um, so it's one of the things you have to look at your own organization and try to decide if it makes sense. But if you're trying to cost justify SD WAN to your bosses, that might be one area that you'd take a look at. Um, just you know, obviously keeping in mind full, you know, disclosures and all of that, right? Like I'm not telling you to go out and replace your MPLS circuits. This is simply something that you can look into. Okay. Whew. All right. So we are at a little less than 10 minutes left. We've got two more things to cover, but they're both pretty quick. Um, of course, you can dive deep into either one of these, but I just wasn't planning on drill drilling too deep into either one of these. Uh, the first is this concept of on-ramp. Now, Cisco creates, and of course this came from Viptela, but still, uh, there are two different types of on-ramps. There's on-ramp for IaaS, infrastructure as a service, and on-ramp for SaaS, software as a service. These are ways that we can use SD-WAN to make our network, not our network, make our communications with our cloud more efficient, which is, it seems really odd. Like, wait a second, I can, I can make my communications to the cloud more efficient by deploying SD-WAN? That doesn't seem intuitive at first. But here's how this works. IaaS, the idea of IaaS, on-ramp on for IaaS, is that it will automatically deploy a uh, an edge device. I was going to say V edge, but really it's just a V edge or C edge into the cloud. So the idea is I might have a bunch of VMs in a cloud space like Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, etc. Um, actually, I think those are the only two <laughs> vendors that are supported at this point, uh, unless one has been added since last I saw. But the idea is that you can go into cloud on ramp for IaaS within vManage, and it'll automatically push it'll push an edge router onto your virtual machine network and connect that back into your SD-WAN fabric. So now your virtual space in a cloud somewhere is actually part of your SD-WAN fabric. I think that's really cool. Uh, I, I, you can do that manually. There's, there's no harm in doing it yourself. You can do exactly what on-ramp for, no, John, I'm sorry, trying to say it. What you what on ramp for IaaS does, you can do manually as well. There's nothing special about IaaS uh, on ramp for IaaS that you you don't get anything extra. It's just the automated deployment of these resources. On ramp for SaaS, however, that's an interesting one. The software as a service says that I have, like, <clears throat> I think I even used the example when we talked about on prem versus cloud a few sessions ago. Is that like I've got my budgeting app and I no longer install my app onto my PC. Instead, I use a cloud service. I just point my web browser, log in, manage my budget there. That's a software as a service concept because I'm not running the application anymore on my home PC. I just point my web browser to it and it's running in somebody else's data center somewhere. So if I have that concept, this takes a little bit of drawing out here. Um, I'm just going to do one WAN circuit for now just for simplicity's sake. What if I had a scenario like this, where I have, um, trying to think of how, to, how exactly to do this. What if I had internet at all of these locations? And so I'm going to connect, my user is coming in, I'm trying to access my software as a service. Well, what this router is doing is it is actually targeting a primary and a secondary internet link. So assumedly this would be my primary and maybe that would be my secondary. And I'm, I'm sending sort of a, a, a ping of sorts <clears throat> to that software as a service provider. And I'm trying to figure out really ultimately, what's the best way for me to reach that software as a service provider? 
if this is a worldwide situation and maybe this is in a completely different country and that internet circuit is just better, even with the latency in here, which it does take into account, it takes this connection into account, adds that to the internet circuit here and compares that with the native connection, it might decide to send that to another location and take advantage of the better internet. So it actually improves our ability to use software as a service uh, from the perspective of I've got multiple, you know, I like the word on-ramp, honestly. It's like I've got multiple on-ramps to the internet. Which on-ramp should I choose? Should I choose the one that's close by? Or am I going to get on there and get stuck in a traffic jam? <laughs> or should I drive a little ways and jump on the, the on-ramp there? And then it's actually a much faster journey. I have no idea if that analogy worked or not. But that's the concept of on-ramp, cloud on-ramp for, for software as a service. Um, so again, it's weird because there's two different on-ramp services that they're both cloud related, but they have nothing to do with each other. They're very different with how they operate. But just understand that IaaS is more about auto deploying edge devices into the cloud and software as a service is more about trying to figure out the best path to my cloud provider. And last but not least, and there's not a whole lot to say about this at this point, um, is, hold up, I'll write it out. The analytics. All right. The analytics. This is a module that must be purchased from Cisco. So again, license. <laughs> I got to buy my license to get vManage. That's supposed to say module. There we go. Uh, what this does is it gives me capacity planning, gives me a lot of reporting. It gives me a uh, much greater visibility into what's happening in my SD-WAN environment. Now, from what I've heard, V Analytics, when Cisco acquired it, wasn't quite in a great spot, but I think it's been getting a lot better. Cisco's been investing a lot of effort into improving that. So if you if you gave that a shot early on and you were like, it just doesn't really do much, it might be worth checking out again. And you might be able to get a demo license from your Cisco team if you reach out to them. But what this is doing is it's also going to um, be monitoring the, uh, the, the different WAN links and it's going to be take wait wait a second oh whoops yeah that's okay never mind i forgot to mention this with the uh with the on ramp for sas that's <laughs> like in my notes i'm like wait i'm in the wrong section um there's this concept of viptela quality of experience vqoe that software as a service concept was going to be comparing the vqoe out the different links so basically that's that number that it's comparing to try to figure out what the best link is it's rated from 0 to 10 and, and this concept of VQOA is being monitored. Well, you can see um, the VQOE for the whole system by using vAnalytics. So vAnalytics gives you a lot of, it's just like kind of a dashboard of different um, tools that we can use to try to figure out what's going on in our SD-WAN environment at any given time. So we look at the VQOE actually on a on per application basis using vAnalytics. So I can look at my voice over IP and say, hey, what level of quality of experience am I getting today versus yesterday versus a month ago? Is my experience going up? Is it going down? Is it maintaining a good level, right? And then, and truly, you can log in, take a look sometimes, and say, "Oh, wait a second, my uh, this application is doing really well, but this application is doing really poorly. Well, why would that application be doing poorly? You know, maybe I should check my application routing policies. Maybe it's getting routed out a bad direction. I mean, who knows? Um, I can see downtime statistics. I can see um, just application again. I mentioned capacity planning, so you're looking at like uh, how's my bandwidth doing? Am I at 60% capacity? Am I at 80% capacity at peak hours? So the, the vAnalytics module is, again, it's when, when Cisco started, I think it was more of a, a dream of where this could go, but it's actually come a long way towards providing a deep analytics into your SD-WAN space, which is, uh, honestly, it's something that we all wish we had for, for every aspect of our network, to be able to wrap our arms around it, tell what's happening, it goes beyond the dashboarding that we get on vManage. Okay, well, I think we're going to potentially wrap up on time today. How about that? So, um, and then uh, my camera said, it's time to go. Let's go. So, um, hey, thank you very much, everyone, for hanging out with us. We had a, again, it's been a long conversation on SD-WAN. There was a lot to cover over the last three sessions. There's even more we could cover. So for those who don't know, I'm an instructor on CBT Nuggets. Uh, CBT Nuggets is a site that we've got 
training content from Cisco to Microsoft to uh, CompTIA to you name it. You know, go out and check out our portfolio, uh, cbtnuggets.com. And if you want more information on SD-WAN or Encore in general, we've got an entire Encore course there. Um, the SD-WAN material that's within Encore is about, I mean, it's going to be a little bit deeper than what we were able to cover because this is just flyby hour long conversations. Um, but I do personally, I'm the one who does a lot of the SD-WAN whiteboarding and such and from an Encore perspective. But then again, very excited that within the next few weeks, we're going to have an entire SD-WAN course um, out and released, hopefully. Um, I keep saying next few weeks, but you know, ideally in the next month or two, we'll, we'll see. Just depends on how long it takes to process and get it out there. But I'm very excited for it. Um, working with Knox Hutchinson, Keith Barker, um, super excited to be working with those guys on, on this topic. So um, I'm going to hang out in the chat for another five or 10 minutes. So if anybody's got any questions, be sure to stick around and ask those. Otherwise, oh, very important. We are taking a break in two weeks. So we're ending SD-WAN. We're going to start SD Access, another very exciting topic. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and take one week off as we kind of prepare for that. And so even though I say one week off, it's every other week, right? So um, our next session will actually be, I believe it's October 21st. I believe that's what it is. Uh, maybe 20. It'll, the ending slide will tell you when it is. <laughs> but it's in four weeks from today. So I look forward to seeing you there. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.